What's lubing my slip and slides? I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, the show where every week uh, I talk about a new terrible person and, and try a new terrible introduction to try and get a reaction from my guests. Uh, Caitlin Durante, how are you uh, How are you feeling about that one? Who's lubing up your slip and slide? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, that was the intro. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would. I liked it. To me, whoever's lubing up your slip and slide is a good person because you want your slip and mm-hmm. slide nice and lubed. Oh yeah, otherwise you'll get some real bad tears. Yeah, you you don't want those tears, those slip and slide no. tears. So you're gonna want that lube. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the person... but I still want to know who is doing it. Okay, so you're asking me who lubes my slip and slide? <laughs> it's it's more like a like a question I'm asking the universe. I oh like, I see. We're, aren't we all wondering on some level what's lubing our slip and slides? I want to tell you specifically who is lubing my slip and slide though just kidding but it is nicholas holt star of um you know some mad movies max Fury Road. mad max yep mm-hmm. tolkien mm-hmm. <laughs> which i won't see actually i will anyway that's in a way nicholas holt is lubing all of our slip and slides i think that's beyond a doubt you're not wrong uh, you're not wrong i'm not wrong yeah. So, uh, Caitlin, I've already introduced you uh, by name, but you want to plug some pluggables before we get into the episode today? I'd love to. Uh, I'm a comedian. I am the co-host of the Bechtel Cast, which is a- Cast. another podcast right here on this darn network. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Mm-hmm. And you were with me to talk about L. Ron Hubbard uh, last year. We yes. Had a, a very good time talking about that. Loved and it. And now we're talking about uh, a different but almost as ambitious grifter. Oh, I um, love the ambitious ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This guy, this guy, motherfucking ambition coming out the wazoo. Uh, out of his that, slip that and slide. That is beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. If, if ambition was a slip and slide, this guy would be lubing that slip and slide up like you would not believe. Right on. Um, Right on. Have you ever heard of John Brinkley? I have not. Have you ever heard of goat testicles? Uh, um, just as a general thing? Yeah, as a concept, as I a thing that exists. I am familiar with testicles and goats, and by proxy, I am familiar with the idea that uh, goats would have testicles, some of them. Now, and, and, and I understand you're not going to have an exact number here, Caitlin, but would you venture to guess how many times you've heard the phrase goat testicles in your life up to this point, not counting the two times I've brought it up so far? I would say, like, exactly that phrase, or even just, like, a variation on, like, goat balls or goat any, nuts. Any sort of, yeah, direct reference to the to the testicular glands of a goat. Honestly, it's more than you think, because if memory serves, goats have enormous testicles in relation to their body. They're pretty sizable. So I feel like I've been to like different petting zoos and people have like commented on goat balls. So I feel like I've heard some variation on it maybe like 10 times throughout my life. 10 times. Yeah. If that's the case, then I suspect for you and for most of our listeners, you are about to hear the phrase goat testicles more than you've ever heard it before in your entire life. Great. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited for this. John Romulus Brinkley came into this world on July 8th in the year of our Lord, 1885. His father, John Richard Brinkley, was a former medic in the Confederate Army. His mother, Sarah Burnett, was the niece of his dad's fourth wife, which is a chain of parentage that is best not contemplated too deeply. When John was five, his mother died. His father died when he was 10, and John was raised by his aunt Sally. He grew up in Jackson County, North Carolina, and seems to have been a rather ambitious child. He recalled later that he grew up dreaming of John Brinkley freeing the slaves, John Brinkley illuminating the world, John Brinkley facing an assassin's bullet for the sake of his people, John Brinkley healing the sick. Can I stop you so. right there? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, his middle name is Romulus? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> that... Like the guy who killed his brother to make Rome. Right, okay. Uh, for some reason, yeah. I am like, oh, that's a Star Trek thing? <laughs> I don't know enough about well, history, as you can tell. It's possible that they were just anticipating uh, Star Trek's second or third best villain species, uh, but, but right. more likely it was a reference to Roman mythology. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I I, yeah. I suppose that tracks. Ro- yeah, yeah I, I would. 
I would say that's more likely. Okay. Uh, his neighbors recall him being, quote, kind of a reckless-like boy who was lively as a cricket, because, again, it was old-timey days, and people said shit like lively as a cricket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John's education was not up to snuff with his ambitions. By the age of 16, he'd been forced to leave school and get a job. He worked first as a mailman and then as a telegraph operator. This job moved him to New York and then to New Jersey. It seemed like he was on the path for a decent middle-class life, but then, at age 21, his Aunt Mom Sally died, and he was forced to return to Jackson County to settle her affairs. Wait, his his Aunt aunt Mom, right? Yeah, I mean, his aunt aunt who raised him. Oh, okay. She's his Aunt Mom. Okay, I'm I'm still a little confused on who the his parentage. relatives are yeah and like which how much incest did happen but I well guess. it's confusing because his actual mom is the niece of his dad's wife uh his dad's ex-wife okay. which i think makes his real mom his aunt mom too so it, right it's confusing yes yeah i'm not yeah. gonna he, try to understand it <laughs> it's it's best not to try to parse that out too deeply <laughs> yeah okay now, while he was back in Jackson County dealing with his aunt, mom, his second aunt mom's uh, funeral, uh, he met an old friend from school named Sally Wilk. Uh, now that they were both mature adults, they started vibing off one another, and then fucking, and then one month after Aunt Sally's death, they got married. Uh, wife Sally understood her husband's unrequited ambition to get into medicine. She told him that he didn't need to waste a bunch of time in medical school to become a doctor. Agreed. And this was true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the in the late 1890s, every state government, save three in the United States, had repealed licensing laws for doctors. This was due to a populist movement that had swept the country against the idea of highfalutin educations and licenses, things mm. that were seen as taking power from the common man. The way many people felt, why shouldn't anyone be able to declare themselves a doctor for any reason? Um, yeah. So that's that's sort of where things were in the late night. You, you're down with that? I'm down with that. Too too much education out there. Let's scale it back. I'm I'm having a bunch of hats printed up right now that just say "Make every American a doctor again." Um, <laughs> I think that'll 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 deal with the problem of not enough good jobs and the student loan problem. It's really like a, a silver bullet for a couple of like our health care crisis, uh, our debt crisis. Just make everybody a doctor. Right. I ha- I have so much student loan debt, and I it, it needs mm-hmm. so much medical attention, and I don't know what to do about any of it. Well, and Caitlin, if you, I, I don't know how much student loan debt you have, but if you look at whatever that number is and then declare yourself a doctor, I'm going to bet it seems a lot more reasonable. That's true, because if I have the mm-hmm. income of a doctor, that, you know, $70,000 that yeah. I owe, that's pocket change for a doctor. That's probably. nothing. Yeah. A shitty doctor will make twice that in a year. Yeah. See, this is, this is a solid plan. Yes. Um. Anyway, uh, at, at around this point in the late 1890s, a teacher named Lemuel Shattuck was asked by the Massachusetts State Legislature to carry out a survey of the state's sanitary and medical facilities during this period. Uh, his summary of the state of Massachusetts sanitary facilities uh, is pretty accurate for sort of the state of, of medical education in most of the U.S. at the time. Quote, okay. Anyone, male or female, learned or ignorant, an honest man or a knave, can assume the name of physician and practice upon anyone to cure or to kill, as either may happen, without accountability. It's a free country. Wait, to cure so or to kill? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yep. Good. <laughs> so doctors, our response should be killing people is what they're saying. Doctors shouldn't be held to a high standard of not killing people. They should be able to do whatever they want because anyone should be a doctor. Yes. This is this is a real thing that was a popular uh, line of thought in America at the time. Good. Okay. Now, uh, John Brinkley, yeah, uh, pretty presently with his uh, his new wife's advice, became Doctor John Brinkley. Now, this was not he was not a doctor, obviously, in any like licensed sense of the word. Sure. Uh, but he started traveling around and acting as what was known as a Quaker doctor. Um, this was sort of a meme in America at this point, uh, and I'm going to quote from the book Charlatan by Pope Brock to uh, explain what exactly was going on there. Okay. Quote, there was a set pattern to most Quaker doctor shows. First, a fiddler or a dancer got the crowd warmed up. A short morality play followed in which a noble head of house or ringleted female died pathetically for lack of a miracle tonic identified by name. Finally, the physician himself, Brinkley, shot on stage in a dinner plate hat, cutaway coat, and pious pants that buttoned up the sides. Veeing and thouing, singing and selling, waving a bottle of Ayer's cathartic pills, or maybe burdock blood bitters, or Aunt Fanny's worm candy. One thing was for sure. Whatever it was cured whatever you had. So <laughs> Okay, wait. So you've got a warm-up comic, 
You've got a feature yeah. and you've got a headliner. Okay. And the headliner is pretending to be a Quaker doctor who sells you uh, nonsense medicine. And no matter what you have and no matter what's being hawked at the people, it works and it's a cure-all. I mean, yeah. that's some... Okay, I like that. I like that they pretty much, you know, just... Uh, I mean, they're like, this is a stand-up show and it's yeah, going to be yeah. hack as shit, but... It's gonna. People are gonna love it. It sounds, and it's one of those things where, like, back in back in those days, there wasn't TV, there wasn't even radio, uh, there was fucking nothing to do for most people. So, right. like, some fake doctor comes to town and puts on a show. Maybe you buy his pills just because it's a distraction. I uh, mean, he's he's yeah. selling merch. He's like, here's my he's show. Selling merch. Here's yeah. the merch that you saw in the show. I mean, brilliant. Mm-hmm. Good good business plan. I love it. Yes, solid branding. Yeah. Now, um. This was obviously what we would call snake oil uh, selling. Like Brinkley was a snake oil salesman. Mm-hmm. Uh, have, have you ever wondered where the term snake oil comes from, Caitlin? Well, I haven't wondered that only because I'm not. I don't know if I've ever heard that before. If I have, like, I snake just snake oil. Yeah, I don't know. I'm again. I don't know what Romulus is, and I don't know what snake oil is. I'm an idiot. Well, a, a co- snake oil salesman is a common term for like uh, somebody who sells bogus, like people call Alex Jones a snake oil salesman because okay. he sells his brain pills that are full, full of lead and stuff. Right. And the term came, uh, was coined in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, which was would have been when Brinkley was about eight years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and it came when a man wearing a cowboy costume got on stage and started strangling dozens of rattlesnakes to death and collecting the liquid that oozed out of them and selling it as a medicine. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's literally where the term snake oil salesman comes from. I that's mean, it's nice. it's a very literal thing. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Just a man strangling snakes. And getting the oil from the snakes. <clears throat> and you know, in 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 terms of our previous conversation about like these shows as entertainment, I would absolutely watch a man dressed as a fucking cowboy strangling snakes on stage. And collecting like, whether the or not ooze? he gets bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's a show. Hell yeah. Yes. Oh, I kind of want to see Patton Oswalt do that. Right. Why <laughs> yeah. Why isn't Kevin Hart, my favorite comedian, <laughs> JK, uh, strangling snakes on stage? Well, and, and the great thing about most stand-up comedians is that I wouldn't really care if they or the snakes won. Like, either way, I'm, I'm going to get a good show. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, Mo- like most Carrot com- Top. <laughs> right, most comedians probably should get bitten a little bit by a snake. Yeah. Couple of including me. I I need to <laughs> you know, <clears throat> to get in check, I need to be bitten by a snake. Now, some, now Caitlin, how many rattlesnakes do you think you could throttle if you if you if if your career was on the line? Uh Sophie is helping me out and saying four? I agree. Four? Yeah. That's a pretty good number of snakes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's solid. I think Sophie has a lot of confidence in you. Thank you, uh, Sophie. Or at least in your wrists, because if I, as I understand <laughs> it, throttling uh, uh, rattlesnakes is is really wrist work more I, than anything. I have a very firm grip, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I've I've noticed that. Mm-hmm, that's a big yeah. thing about me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, for months, Sally and John Brinkley toured around pretending to be a Quaker doctor and his wife selling nonsense medicine from a wagon. This worked for a while, but it eventually turned out that he and Sally didn't really like one another. Mm. They split up, not even bothering to divorce, and he headed off to pursue his medical ambitions in a more serious fashion. He enrolled at the Bennett Medical College of Chicago and then the Eclectic Medical University of Kansas City. Oh, so he did decide to go to medical school. Well, he went to, he went to things that were that had names that made them sound like medical okay. schools, Caitlin. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I see. So these aren't accredited yeah. universities. No, these are in no way accredited I, universities. Okay. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah, and he didn't get full degrees from these non-accredited universities <laughs> anyway. Good. Uh, he got a $25 loan from a loan shark that he never managed to repay, and eventually he skipped town before finishing school. Good for him. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he did get like a, a sort of undergraduate certification, I guess you'd call it, but again, it was unaccredited. Um, now, in a little bit of fairness to John Brinkley, at this point in time in history, 
medicine wasn't really a thing in the way it is today. Um, so eclectic medicine is what we'd call like naturopathy now. It's using like herbs and and poultices and like mm-hmm. waving sticks around and chanting and stuff. Like sure. it, it it incurred all of that stuff. But this was 1908, so like the real doctors were pouring mercury in people and bleeding them to death. Yes. Um. So there were actually situations in which a doctor with Brinkley's training would probably do better work on you than a real doctor because eclectic doctors didn't bleed people or feed them mercury. So <laughs> it's there he's going to be beyond the point of being fair to at a certain point uh but but up to this state like he's not necessarily a hack and a fraud so cuz he- medicine it, is kind of nonsense. So him being a bad doctor actually makes him a better doctor than the real doctors. Like him being fake, is that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's it's kind of that. Like if you're uh, uh, most of medicine was wrong at this point. Yes. Um. And and if you're wrong in a way to which you're not filling people's bodies with mercury and radium, uh-huh. then you're better for them. And like there is some there are some like herbs and stuff that have actual medicinal potential. So like oh, there were yeah, some eclectic doctors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, smoking that. It is still legal at this point. Um mm-hmm. so yeah. Um so uh, uh about four percent of doctors in this period were eclectics. Um of course Brinkley was not one of them because he didn't graduate. Uh, but he did get an undergraduate degree that qualified him to practice medicine in a couple of states. Okay. Um, and you know, while he was sort of bumming around St. Louis drinking heavily, he met a one-armed man named James Crawford, and the two decided to open what was essentially a fake medical practice together. Okay. Uh, Crawford decided to go by the name Dr. Burke, and Brinkley went by the name Dr. Blakely. They called their operation the Greenville Electromedical Doctors. Now, I, I just was trying to be fair to eclectic medicine by talking about how it could be more reasonable than real medicine at that point in time in history. Uh, this is the point at which we get past them being reasonable. Okay, got uh, it. Because 1908 is a period in which electricity is still new and exciting. Mm-hmm. And like every new technology, people assume that because it was shiny and different, it must confer incredible health benefits. Sure. So electric medicine was kind of a fad at this point uh people would do- like fake doctors would sell electric ointments electric toothbrushes electric tinctures electric food electric corsets uh just by shocking someone with electricity you could claim to be curing them mm-hmm. and most people would be surprised enough by the sensation that they just sort of go along with it sure uh, according to the book charlatan quote Dr. Burke asked a few questions, made a few notes, and put out his palm for $25, a massive sum. From there, the client passed into the treatment room, where Dr. Blakely spent the morning injecting colored water into rear ends. If anyone asked, he said it was electric medicine from Germany. Into people's rear ends? Yeah, he's he's shooting dyed water into people's asses and telling (laughs) them that it's electric German medicine. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, good. Is there actually... So is he also... So shooting electricity into people's asses or No, he's okay. just lying and claiming it's electric water medicine. Okay, I think okay. they probably have some like electric gizmos near the water so that people believe that it's electric medicine, but sure. it, it's it's just ass water. It's just colored ass water. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um this this scam worked out for a while, but obviously shooting people's asses full of colored water did not cure any known problem aside from the dubious problem of not having enough colored water in your asshole. Uh Brinkley and Crawford were eventually rightfully arrested for being frauds and thus ended the saga of the Greenville Electro Medical Doctors. Okay. This tale is old. I as feel time. like um what do people get? What is that called? A uh, colonic to, to like clean out your bum? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I I wonder if maybe that like dyed water in their in people's asses was doing something like that. I don't know if colonics have any sort of medical benefits, but I I just want to give him credit where credits due, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think colonic would be a good example of like modern day snake oil because while there are there are like certain situations in which like they can be helpful, they're kind of treated as cure alls for problems, right? Um. I, I guess I think it's the same thing as like electrocuting someone and it being a weird sensation. And so you assume something medical has happened. Right. I think a lot of people get stuff shot up their asses and are like, well, that feels weird. It must be doing something. Uh huh. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. The placebo <laughs> effect kind of does the rest. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, wait, I was going to make a pun like the acebo effect, but it, I don't know if it was going to work. The but pl- I said it anyway. Acebo. Yeah. I think that's one of those those jokes that would that works better written than spoken. Yes. 
Yeah, but that's a good one. Well, we tried. One. We tried. We tried. We tried. Now, after getting out of jail, not a Dr. Brinkley met a girl named Minnie. She would prove to be the love of his life, mainly because she was exactly as down with his dreams of pretending to be a doctor as he was. For three mm-hmm. years, the couple wandered around Kansas and Arkansas, with Brinkley working as a traveling doctor and Minnie acting as his assistant. He eventually made enough money at this to buy a diploma, which made his claims of a- to actually be a doctor more credible. <laughs> On May 7th, 1915, the Eclectic Medical University of Kansas City gave him the validation he'd always craved. This MD cost Brinkley $100 and gave him the right to practice medicine in eight states. So he immediately set up shop in Arkansas working as a rural doctor. His big strategy was to rent a horse and charge out of town numerous times, as if he was constantly on important emergency calls, saving lives. This particular grift did not work out, and he and many had to leave. So okay. we're at the, the low point in our hero's journey right now. But you know what can be the high point in, in your hero's journey, listener? Uh, and, and you as well, Caitlin. Yes. Is the fine products and or services that... Uh, advertise on our show which that aren't certainly snake oil. yeah that aren't going to be snake oil no we do not uh advertise for any companies that will shoot electric water up your ass and if we did i promise you listener it will be the best electric ass water that anybody <laughs> serves you know we we vet all ass based businesses uh personally i do show. Personally, i personally absolutely. do that yes it's critical it's important you yeah. can't advertise for ass based medicine without without putting your own ass on the line exactly yeah, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. So, products. We're back. Oh, those are some good products. Those are really good. Wait, can I just quickly recap what we've learned so far about his like? Please do. Please do. So he practices medicine, sort of, without any sort of credentials, yeah. and then he goes to uh an unaccredited university and doesn't finish and then opens up a medical practice and then gets arrested. And then he buys a diploma that, without, you know, getting any sort of medical train or like any additional medical training, but because he has the diploma that he bought, he is now certified to practice medicine in eight States. Now is this the eclectic medicine or is this like the more legitimate I mean, he- medicine it's eclectic medicine none of it's i mean yeah it, it, it's eclectic medicine okay. which is seen as semi-legitimate at that point in time i see okay great yeah. well i mean i'm proud of him and his accomplishments yeah, he's, so far he's achieved his dreams yeah uh, i'm sure nothing horrible will happen <laughs> definitely not so in 1916 dr brinkley got a job at a meat packing plant in kansas city working as a doctor for the animals they kept on hand. He spent many hours on duty, bored, and watching the most entertaining thing available to him in those pre-television days. Billy Goat's fucking. He later <laughs> recalled being impressed by their considerable lubricity, which I think means the Billy Goat vaginas get really lubed up, but I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, the, uh, yeah, the, the main syllable there is, is lube so that's that's why it's my guess the, the yeah. root word yeah so okay the good he, good he thought billy goats fucked good and he was also impressed by the fact that they got sick less than any other species of animal at the plant hmm. so he started to think about what, what, what would it be possible to take some of the some of the traits of a billy goat and put that into a person <laughs> okay now, can't wait to see where this is going further, yeah <laughs> It's important you understand the importance of what were called glands to cutting-edge medicine of the day. Mm -hmm. Now, glands were generally testicles from various species, including human beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to read a quote from uh, the website Quack Watch that sort of sums up uh, the building science in this period of of gland replacement. Okay. Charles Edward Brown Sicard, a noted French physiologist, had shocked the medical community by injecting himself with the crushed testicles of young dogs and guinea pigs. Afterwards, he claimed that he had regained the physical stamina and intellectual vigor of his youth. Many men availed themselves of Sicard's methods, but once the placebo effect was filtered out, little remained. And Vienna physiologist Eugene Steineck proposed that youthful vitality could be repo- restored by increasing levels of testosterone. The easiest way to do this, Steineck said, was through vasectomy. Sperm production wasted testosterone, and if the channel leading from the testes to the ejaculatory duct were tied off, then blood levels of testosterone would rise. 
Brinkley may also have heard of the work of Serge Voronoff, a French doctor who was stirring up a storm of controversy with his experimental gland transplants. Voronoff had been a physician in the court of the King of Egypt, and there had spent a great deal of time treating the court eunuchs, who suffered from a variety of illnesses. He hypothesized that maintaining active genital glands was the secret to health. As proof, he cited his experiments with an aging ram into which he had transplanted the testicles of a young lamb. The ram's wool got thicker, and his sexual vigor returned. Voronoff then went on to transplant bits of monkey testes into aging men. He claimed success, although he could offer no scientific validation of his claim. So, okay, so science of this time was hawking a lot of putting balls in. Yeah, yeah, just like just men being obsessed with their balls, and that has not changed to the <laughs> science of today. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Yes, but in huh. that point in time, they would look at other animals that had big balls or fucked a lot and be like, "What if I put those balls in my balls?" Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I that mean, was... it's some innovative thinking. So yeah, it, it's innovative. <laughs> um, so all this was cooking off in the air in the medical community while Brinkley was getting his start. Uh, now, in mid 1917, he was briefly drafted by the military to work as a doctor for the 64th Infantry Division. He served a total of about two months, most of which he spent in sick bay, complaining of multiple rectal fistulas. He was kicked out of the military in August. Next, Doctor Brinkley and Minnie moved to a little Kansas town called Milford. It was not quite in the middle of nowhere, but you might call it nowhere adjacent. Brinkley worked as a rural doctor again, and his wife worked as a midwife. They made enough money to get by, working incredibly hard and providing a useful service to their local community. Naturally, John Brinkley hated it and desperately wanted a way out. <laughs> that way was He's like, not enough balls! A... Not enough <laughs> balls! Well, the good news is that he was about to get so many more balls oh, than anybody should ever have. Thank goodness. He was approached one day by a 46-year-old farmer named Bill Stitzworth. Now, Stitzworth came by Brinkley's office one day and said, There's something wrong with me, though to look at me you wouldn't judge it. I do look husky, don't I? When Brinkley nodded, Stitzworth continued, I'm all in, no pep, I'm a flat tire. Now, this was Stitzworth's way of slowly admitting in, you know, 19, like, teens terms mm. that his dick didn't work so well anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this shouldn't have been surprising. I think it's pretty normal for 46-year-old men who work an intense, back-breaking physical labor job to have, have trouble with that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it might be weirder if he'd had no issues at all. But Stitzworth complained to Dr. Brinkley that he'd tried serums, medicines, and electricity, all to no avail. Now... Next, according to legends that were later spread by Dr. Brinkley himself, the old farmer sighed and said, Too bad I don't have billy goat nuts. <laughs> now, Good. We only have Dr. Brinkley's recollections of what happened next, uh, and they come from a biography he commissioned 20 years later called Life of a Man. So you know, put a little, bit of, a little bit of salt on this next quote. Sure. The doctor half closed his eyes and considered, and then he shook his head slowly. The code of ethics his father had drilled into him forever forbade him from any conduct, especially with relation to healing, except the utterly honest and straightforward. But the father begged and begged, and eventually Brinkley agreed. He would try and put goat testicles into the farmer's body. His official publications made it later seem like he was basically forced into it out of sheer empathy for the distraught patient, but years later, Stitzworth's family would admit that Brinkley had offered the old farmer hundreds and hundreds of dollars to let him experiment on his body. Wow. So, that's cool. Where's this farmer getting all this money for for goat balls? Oh, the, uh, the, the farmer got the money from Dr. Brinkley. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He bribed he bribed him to put, get let him put goat balls in him to test out the surgery. Uh, I see. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Brinkley removed a healthy goat's testicles and just sort of shoved him inside the farmer's nutsack and then sewed it up. <laughs> uh Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Stitzworth reported an increase in vitality, possibly due to the placebo effect and also possibly due to just lying. The mm -hmm. word spread across town, and soon another farmer, and then another, had received goat ball implants. Shortly thereafter, Miss Stitzworth demanded that she get a set of goat ovaries to increase her own fertility and vitality. Oh, Next, no. according to Life of a Man, quote, <laughs> Dimly, Brinkley had begun to realize that he was gifted beyond the run of doctors. So he, he realized that he was uh, an unusually talented surgeon mm -hmm. uh, and an unusually brilliant thinker due to the incredible success of of his his goat testicle and ovary implants. Now, uh, and, I, don't, I don't know if you yeah. know this or not, but is he replacing the human testicles with the goat no. stuff, or he's just adding them in addition to what's he's, already there? He's just jamming them up in there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> just oh, just shoving, oh no. shoving. Now, sometimes it's just bits of goat testicles. He does it a little bit different every time because he's not a real doctor. Sure. <laughs> like, I mean, who needs consistency when it comes who to needs consistency medical... With medical procedures? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, he decided that someone with his sheer God-given talent could not limit themselves to the rules of the jealous sheep ethics of the uh, American Medical Association and the Mm -hmm. other gradually professionalizing medical bodies of the era. Dr. Brinkley had developed an intense dislike of the AMA. Some of this may be due to the fact that a few weeks after his first goat ball implantation, he traveled to Chicago to take a refresher course on surgery. He failed the class. His teacher said that this was because of his attendance not being regular and because of his indulgence in alcohol. I admonished him to leave liquor alone and to concentrate on worthwhile endeavor and improve himself as a man and a physician, to which he replied, I have a scheme up my sleeve and the whole world will hear of it. (laughs) Okay, so he's just like this drunk dude who's like... He's just a drunk guy putting balls in him. Loudly admitting that he's planning to scam everybody. And pretty successfully scamming everybody. Yeah. Yeah. All right. In August 1918, John Brinkley opened the Brinkley Institute of Health in Milford, Kansas. The growth of his clinic was massively aided by the fact that, months after his surgery, Stitzworth and his wife had a boy. They named him Billy. (laughs) Oh, no. After (laughs) Billy Goat? (laughs) He became the first goat gland baby, and of course his very existence was credited to Dr. Brinkley's incredible science. More testimonials followed soon after the old farmer, and business then poured into Dr. Brinkley's clinic. He began charging $750 an operation. That's about $14,000 in modern money. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, it's expensive. It's like what you'd pay for major cosmetic surgery today, but it's just goat testicles. Right. Um... Now, obviously, many of these implantations did not work. Some of them, I mean, none of them worked, but many of them uh, had disastrous side effects. Uh, but it is kind <laughs> of shocking say. how many people had goat testicle pieces put into their balls without anything terrible happening. Uh, the human body is incredible, is what I'm getting at. I mean, um, it's very resilient, yes. Yeah, yeah. Part of why so many people reported incredible benefits undoubtedly owes to the placebo effect. Some of it, though, was due to Dr. Brinkley's peculiar advertising brilliance. Here's Quackwatch again. All men needed the Brinkley operation, he declared, but the procedure was most suited to the intelligent and least suited to the stupid type. This, of course, ensured that few of his patients would admit they had not benefited from the operation. So uh, he warned people before going in that, like, it doesn't work on dumb people. <laughs> wow. So That's, he's it's kind of brilliant. So he's putting people in a position where they have to basically just lie and say, yeah, this is working out great yeah. for me. Huh, okay. Love yeah. love a lot of uh, love heavy gaslighting uh, in medical procedures as well. I mean Oh, he he is the gaslightingest doctor. Uh, I think I can imagine. All right. <laughs> oh man. I mean now, so, so wait, another question. He he's sure. mostly doing this for um test he's putting testicles into men's ball yeah. sex. And, yep. But there was at least one case of a woman having uh over a number goat of ovaries. Cases. Okay, so there are okay. All right, so he's It's just that he did more balls than ovaries. I see, but he's uh maybe not equal, but like, you know, there's some He definitely Yeah. He he ovaries up a lot of ladies. And actually, <laughs> uh, you know, spoilers, Caitlin. He's kind of a feminist icon, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Love Fe- it. Feminist icon, goat ball doctor John Brinkley. <laughs> Great. Now, right as the greatest <laughs> grift of <laughs> right as the greatest grift of Dr. Brinkley's life was kicking off, the great influenza epidemic hit. This is the nightmarish rave, wave of disease that killed more people than World War One. It was a terrible nightmare, and completely counter to the rest of his life, Dr. Brinkley rose wonderfully to the situation. He was remembered by locals as being a wonderful doctor during this period who only lost a single patient to the flu epidemic and worked all around, you know, offering people uh, free care and whatnot to take care of the horribly ill people who were dying of the influenza. So. Mm-hmm. This is like a singular moment in his career. Uh, like for this this one period of time, he was a real doctor. Uh, okay. and, and then he just went right back to scamming people for the rest of his life. But there is one redeeming moment in his life, and it's the influenza epidemic. So All right. there you go. Yeah. 
Now, once the epidemic was over, Dr. Brinkley got right back to work scamming the shit out of people. As his work drew attention and media coverage, people were soon literally camping out around his clinic. Men and women. For a little while, implanting goat ovaries in ladies was almost as booming a trade as implanting goat testicles in men. Okay, Dr. Okay, Brinkley okay. claimed the ovaries would enhance fertility, but would also remove wrinkles and increase breast size. So, I mean, everything that a woman cool. cares about. Everything that a woman cares about in one set of <laughs> severed goat ovaries. I'm going to go get my goat ovaries right after we're done. I mean... You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil the next ad break, but we are selling goat ovary pills mm. uh, for a limited time. Yeah, yeah guaranteed to uh, you know, do whatever, whatever you need. Goat ovaries will take care of it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So uh, now, obviously, a lot of uh, Brinkley's patients got sick and died uh, because he was just filling people up with the dead body parts of animals, and that's not great for you. Mm. But the internet didn't exist, and so Dr. Brinkley was able to sort of fill the media of the day with tales of his patients, quote, astonishing sexual vigor, and most people just sort of trusted him. He also shared case studies of patients whose lives were changed in more significant ways. One popular account was of a boy Brinkley described as deranged, who, in his words, quote, had been told finally that he was incurable and must remain a mental defected, defective. He had decided to commit suicide if I failed to remedy his condition. And 36 hours after the insertion of goat glands, this patient's temperature had risen to above 103 Fahrenheit, but became normal 24 hours later and has re since remained so. His mind is gradually cleared. He looks and feels younger and is contemplating marriage. The hideous dreams and nightmares which had destroyed his sleep and rest all his past life have left him. My second case of insanity, caused this time by excessive masturbation, was a young bank clerk brought to me from a state institution. Following gland transplantation, his mind cleared completely, and he is now the head of a large banking institution. I so mean, cool. those are some ringing endorsements. Now, it's interesting to me that goat testicles can both uh, increase your vitality and, and help you get erections to impregnate your wife and stop your excessive masturbation so that you can become a bank president. And also but, apparently um, cure mental illness and yes. depression. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why wouldn't goat balls clear depression? I get, exactly. That's just, yeah. That's just obvious. Right. Yeah. So within a, a couple of years, John Brinkley had identified 27 different illnesses that could be cured by goat balls, everything from dementia to farting. He assured people that his operations had a 95% success rate, which was just low enough to explain away the odd death or life-altering infection as a result of his not entirely competent surgical ministrations. <laughs> as a rule, Brinkley was way worse at surgery than he was at selling. His slogans, all energy is sex energy, and a man is as old as his glands, were both pretty great. I mean, solid, solid. what year was this? I mean, that, that's, yeah. This is 1918. Wow. <laughs> Like, all energy is sex energy is like something you'd hear at a fucking very specific kind of yoga retreat in Santa Monica. Right. I feel like I <laughs> tweeted that, like, two days ago. <laughs> like... Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. No, okay. He was, he was ahead of his time uh, and will consistently be ahead of his time until the day he dies. Uh, all right. But, but I don't want to spoil things too much. So... Uh, in private, Dr. Brinkley had a habit of calling his patients old fools, especially while drinking. But in public, he was the picture of the genteel man of medicine. Much of his credibility came from the Van Dyke goatee he wore, which was seen as the hallmark of the doctor because people back then were very dumb, just as they all are now. The reality, of course, is that John Brinkley was no more a doctor than I am a mechanic just because I was able to hit my car that one time and make the engine turn over. According to the book Charlatan, he only had a wavering conception of how to perform his own signature surgery. Quote, Sometimes he slivered the animal gland like a clove of garlic and put the pieces in the patient. Sometimes he joined the smaller testicle to the larger, a process he likened to embedding a marble in an apple. Sometimes the operation was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I'm so grossed so out. Okay. Sometimes the operation was no more complex than tossing a Christmas present into a bag. Skill wasn't the issue. <laughs> Technically speaking, he was a competent surgeon when he put his mind to it, but quality control was iffy at best. Brinkley performed operations both before and after the cocktail hour, and as his enterprise expanded, he passed off more and more of the work to assistants with medical credentials even wispier than his own. As a result, dozens of patients died over the years, either in the operating room or shortly after the return home. Many others were permanently maimed. So that's cool. Yeah, very cool. Wait, can I backtrack for just one second? And so do. his like credibility or the reason like people trusted him was largely did you say because of a his goatee? Like 
his yeah, facial that was a big hair? part of it. Okay, so be- yeah, he had the he had the kind of facial hair all doctors were supposed to have. Okay, I didn't realize that was a thing. Number one, number two, were they called goatees back then? And did that have anything to do with the fact that people trusted no. his goat? Because if it was like he has a goatee and then he puts goat balls into your body, that I see what you're getting at. <laughs> but no, they called it a Van Dyke. Um, okay. Sophie will show you the picture of him, and you can see, it, like, it, once you see his facial hair, you'll recognize it as like every doctor in like a 1940s like Looney Tunes cartoon has the I same see. hair. Yeah, you see that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. wild that you could just have a certain type of facial hair and be like, "Yes, this is my profession." Well, I guess he's a doctor. Look at his <laughs> facial hair. <Right. laughs> Oh man. There there was the world like we get down on the internet cuz all the Nazis and the 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 anti-vaccine lies and stuff. Right. But before the internet being a doctor just meant having a goatee and a lab coat. So it's <laughs> it's not like people have ever been very good at vetting reality. Yes, I suppose some progress has been made since then. Yeah. It's but... a, it's just been a consistently mixed bag. Yeah. Now. All right. Uh Dr. Brinkley billed the purpose of his work as aiding hopeless couples in conceiving children. He sold, uh, he slid articles into the no- local news with titles like, Dr. J.R. Brinkley swamped with letters from women craving halo of motherhood. And the reality is that a lot of desperate people did see him as something of a fertility messiah. At one point, he claimed to be able to even reverse hysterectomies by shoving goat ovaries inside ladies. <laughs> but by the summer of 1920, he'd pretty much... <laughs> <laughs> But by the summer of 1920, he'd pretty much stopped performing surgery on female clients. It's debatable as to why. My suspicion would be that stuff like male vitality is easy to boost via the placebo elect alone, effect alone, since erections are largely mental. So if you tell some guy he's got supercharged goat balls in his body, maybe he actually gets more erections. Mm. But you can't really trick women into having a uterus. <laughs> like the, the placebo <laughs> effect doesn't go that uh, far. Robert, <laughs> think again, because I think you could trick me into thinking I had a uterus if I didn't, which I don't want my uterus. So uh, actually, that brings me to me trying to sell my uterus right I mean, here on this and then you can put it in, what okay hang on what if there was a sick goat and <laughs> I, you took out my uterus and gave it to the goat i feel like based on everything we've learned so far that would actually help the sick goat you know you're, you're thinking like a 1920s doctor because right around this time i think it was a french physician took a, a monkey's ovaries and put it in a woman just to see if he could make a monkey human hybrid oh no it, 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 why it, would it, he want to do that <laughs> they were just trying anything these were the throw everything at the wall days of medicine yeah. like there were no rules there was no like like people tried to do everything because they like they just figured out like antibiotics which is like you know you you come from the era when like getting like scraped by a, a a wooden sliver on your way out to the barn is a death sentence, and right. antibiotics seem like fucking magic. Um, so people are just like anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, they, yeah. they they tried everything. Um, so is is like all of this is really ridiculous, and the credible doctors of the day are all against Brinkley and say he's crazy, which we will talk about a lot more later. But people aren't quite as dumb as they would have been in another era to believe this stuff worked just because a lot of medicine was fucking nonsense back then. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, we will continue talking about Dr. John Brinkley and his nonsense medicine. But you know what's not nonsense, Caitlin? The products that we're about to tell you about? Well, you got it half right, but you forgot the services. And the services, yes. Yeah, I'm you so never sorry. want to forget the services. Yeah. A service without a product is like a product without a service. Exactly. Exactly. Products! We're back. Sophie just called me a nerd, which I, I don't appreciate. <laughs> uh, Sophie, Sophie, would you would you kindly, since I'm not there right now, throw the uh, throw the throwing bagels across the room in anger for me? Sophie's going to get throwing bagels. Well, she does that. I'm going to keep reading about Dr. Brinkley. So 
1921, Berkeley had attained enough renown that he was able to visit Park Avenue Hospital in Chicago and perform 34 gonad transplants. He had moved on from just operating on local farmers. One of his patients was a judge. Another was the chancellor of the university's law school, a guy named J.J. Tobias. When the Syracuse Herald interviewed Tobias after and asked if he felt younger, he said, I feel 25 years younger. I'm a new man, full of pep, strong, healthy, ready to go on with my work. I was ill, old, and played out, but the operation has revivified me. Next, the reporter asked, how does it feel to have been old and then be young again? Glorious! It is so wonderful, it is almost unbelievable. The public cannot appreciate what the operation means. There has been some levity over the news of gland operations, but they should be treated with the greatest respect and admiration. So... (laughs) This is this is how he moves on from like I'm gonna give you erections with goat balls to I will literally make you younger with goat testicles and like because people want to f- be younger so badly a whole lot of distinguished men just buy right into it right first of all can yeah. I say that uh, I love your old timey voice thank you the, the, I'm that, very proud of it yeah you're doing a great job <laughs> uh, secondly it's wild I mean I guess this isn't specific to men but I guess because we're talking about I mean men are mostly his patients but the lengths that men will go to to just try to fuck better and have better balls and stuff like, yeah it just, it's it's uh, amazing <laughs> like, yeah it is i feel like if instead of fire the first human invention had been viagra like men at least would never have invented anything else like it would have all it would have all been on women. To they like would figure yeah. out concrete and stuff. Like men would just be no. We've got we've got the dick pill. What else do we need? Like which honestly, I wish that had happened because I think the world would be a much better place if women had invented oh, everything. A thousand else. times better. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, oh, we got to go yeah. back. Let's get a time machine. Go back to you know uh neanderthal days you know caveman times and uh just right. give just give the the men viagra and then be like all right ladies the yeah. your the your path is is free and clear to do whatever you want men the, these pills will make you dicks do whatever you want ladies <laughs> take it away here's yeah it's all on you now <sighs> yeah oh, well, if only. one can help if only so for a long time, John Brinkley was able to basically portray himself as the man who had conquered aging. He began to make bold claims about his ability to cure other diseases, like blindness, in the very near future. His delusions of grandeur were compelling to people who saw him at symposiums and at his office. They were less compelling to the people who worked with him on a daily basis. For one thing, John still drank way too much. One night, he got wasted and destroyed his neighbor's car with an axe for unclear but certainly awesome reasons. <laughs> Another time, he got plowed and chased a bunch of his own patients out of his hospital with a butcher knife. In March of 1921, one of his neighbors filed a protection order against the good doctor. Brinkley explained, I made some remarks concerning this fellow that caused him to be afraid, I guess, and they put me under a bond. I don't know whether I was arrested or not, but I had to give a bond of $1,000 not to shoot him. Oh my God. (laughs) I don't know whether I was arrested or not. And I think, I don't think he's lying about that. I think he was so So drunk that he really was like, yeah, I I don't know what the fuck happened. (laughs) I chase oh. people with weapons all the time. Yikes. This John. is the stuff that makes me almost like him because it, it makes me feel like he's a kindred spirit. Because uh, I, I, I don't know if you know this about me, Caitlin, but I love chasing my patients and neighbors with knives. It's just a good time. Everybody has fun. You get your cardio in. Yeah. yeah just, yeah. I, it's good that, stuff. Good, good, good. Everything's great. <laughs> Anyway, there was a rumor that Dr. Brinkley's assistant, Dr. Osborne, who was one-eared, was one-eared because Dr. Brinkley had literally bitten the other ear off. Oh, my God. It is God. entirely possible that this is the case. Like, a lot of people lost ears for random reasons back then, but yeah, he, he seems like he might have been an ear biter. Yeah. Uh, it would not be the craziest thing he did. No. But no amount of bad behavior from Dr. Brinkley was enough to turn the town of Milford against him. Uh, the huge amount of money he brought in helped, and by the early 20s, he was performing 50 operations a month, which meant his clinic was bringing in $500,000 a year in 1920s money. Wow. That's roughly $7 million a year today. So he's he's doing well for himself. Yes. And a decent chunk of that money got reinvested back into Milford. He paid for new sidewalks, a new sewer, electric lights, a paved road to the railroad station, and a new bank. He tried to start a zoo and even bought the town a bear. Unfortunately, the bear was too loud and it kept Dr. Brinkley awake at night, so he shot it to death. Wait, okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> he bought the town a bear. He sure did. Just a, sure a bear did. to hang to around. Okay. And it was too loud, but so it was... we shot at a bunch. Oh my gosh. I'm yep. just thinking of of Paddington, Paddington Bear, and just... anyway, that's not important. Okay. Here's my real mm-hmm. question. Where is he getting all of the goat balls? Goats. And in fact, uh, <laughs> patients could pick out, they had a pen of goats, and patients would pick out the goat they wanted their balls from. Okay. <laughs> So it was like going to a nice, like one of those fancy steak restaurants where you get to like pick the animal. Uh, right. You get to you get to pick your goat. Or like a lobster testicles. and a lobster. T- okay. Yeah. So I understand that. But goat instead balls... of a lobster, it's testicles. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand that goat balls come from goats. I'm not. I don't know right. who Romulus is, but I do know that much. But so he's like he's is he breeding the goats and how could he even breed them if he's taking all their balls away? And then also. Like that has to mean that's so many goats. Yeah, I mean he's 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 buying a lot of goats. Okay, you know, he's buying fifty <laughs> goats a month or so, um, which is a sizable number of goats. And then just uh, like castrating them, and then yeah, yeah. Did the goats? Do they live after they that? Okay, he's eating no, the I goats. Mean, it, it, the, the goat could stay alive without balls, but right. I assume they were eaten after that. I don't really know though. You know, well, there's also, not a lot been written about his goats. <laughs> I want I I want to know more about his goats. So he's. I feel like because he's such a shitty surgeon and he is drunk all the time, he's probably just accidentally killing these goats when he's like castrating them or whatever. I'm gonna guess he wasn't very careful with the goat. Definitely not. Right? I feel no, so bad no, for I'm all these. I guess that wasn't goats. a priority. Oh my, these poor goats. Yeah, the and goats the are definitely bear. a victim. And the bear is a victim. Uh, all of the people who got goat balls shoved into them, uh, I would say they're also victims, victims too. Although yes. I, yeah. I feel less bad for them than the bear because the bear didn't do fucking anything. No. Like, neither did the goats. I just don't like goats as much as I like bears. And that's, I guess, racism on my part. So I'm fine <laughs> with it. I mean, there's no um, Paddington goat, so I get it. There's but... no Paddington goat. And there's no goat on the California state flag. True. Mm-hmm. But goats are, baby goats are so cute. The way they jump around and, and uh, Yeah, they're and adorable. Hop. Yeah. Very cute. Very cute animals. Now- <sighs> Anyway. I know what you're wondering at this point, Caitlin. Yes. <laughs> what kind of goat? What kind of goat did he get the testicles from? I do wonder that because I don't really know the different t- types of goats. Well, he he preferred to use Toggenberg goat balls oh. um, because he he thought they were better balls. <laughs> One time, he did have a set of patients from California who demanded that he put Angora goat testicles in them. I mean, I guess because Angora goats are used to make very fancy sweaters. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so they wanted. <laughs> They wanted the fanciest goats because they were Californians. Uh, obviously. But apparently, Angora goat testicles stank horribly and oh. made the testicles of his customers stink horribly. <laughs> um, so this this was one of the issues that he encountered in his goat ball practice. Okay. Because so, I'm that's, sure that's their, a bummer. Their, their balls smelled fine otherwise without the Angora yes. goat. Like, <laughs> people certain, aren't certain, bathing every day back then. I'm certain their 1920s balls smelled wonderful <laughs> before the goats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So wait, what is the first type of goat you said? Uh, Toggenberg goats. Toggenberg. I've never heard of if that g- type of goat. Well, now, Caitlin, if you're ever at a party and someone's like, hey, if I want to replace my testicles with goat testicles, what type of goat should I use? You'll know it's a Toggenberg. Yes. There's, there's no other goat to replace your testicles with. And rest assured that every party I go to, that question is being asked. So. Oh, I know, I know. We yeah. go to a lot of the same parties, and I'm <laughs> I'm usually shouting about goat testicles uh, at at any given one of them. Yes, can confirm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, the uh, the issues of patients occasionally demanding smelly goat testicles was minor compared to the major issue presented by real doctor Morris Fishbean. Now, Fishbean was the editor of the Journal of Amer- the American Medical Association, or JAMA, and Fishbean was like an actual doctor. Uh, and the, the AMA at this point, you know, they still did some stuff that we would consider quackery, sure. but they were trying to apply real science to medicine, so they were gradually learning what didn't work as opposed to just continuing to jam goat testicles in people right. uh, for huge amounts of money. Anyway, according to Quackwatch, Fishbean, quote, 
called Brinkley a smooth-tongued charlatan and urged the authorities to revoke his right to practice. Brinkley's assertion that his procedure could cure conditions ranging from insanity to acne to influenza and high blood pressure amounted to quackery, Fishbean said. In response to this, Brinkley called the American Medical Association a meat cutters union and charged that its members were jealous of him because they were losing business. So... By 1922, John Brinkley had gotten rich enough selling quack nonsense remedies to make vain men feel younger that there was really only one place on earth for him to go next. Los Angeles. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, that's where you go. That's where you go. There he met up with Harry Chandler, the owner of the Los Angeles Times. Chandler had invited him out to California in the first place to do a story on him. Because Harry Chandler was the true paragon of journalism, he intended to do this story by having Dr. Brinkley insert goat testicles into one of his editors. He told John, quote, If the operation is a success, I'll make you the most famous surgeon in America. If it's a failure, I'll damn you with the same gusto. Now, the issue that confronted Dr. Brinkley is that, under California law, his medical license was not valid. Thankfully, this was the 1920s, and Harry Chandler was able to secure him a 30-day permit to practice medicine. And so Dr. John Brinkley began cutting out goat testicles and sticking them inside human beings once more. He implanted new balls in Chandler's editor, in a U.S. circuit court judge, in several unnamed movie stars, and, according to rumor, even in Harry Chandler himself. Many of his patients gave his work rave reviews, as can be seen in the title of this 1922 L.A. Times article. New life and glands. Dr. Brinkley's patients here show improvement. Many victims of incurable diseases are cured. 1,200 operations. All are successful. Do so you cool. think, like, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton have... Entirely possible. ...goat balls in their bodies? I think so. Yeah, he, he even, I think he met Buster Keaton, and Buster Keaton made a movie in this time that referenced goat gland operations. Uh, oh really? It's entirely po- yeah, it's entirely possible. Like oh. we know several movie stars cuz it's like they're movie stars. If you tell them you can make them young again and fuck better? Exactly. Like they're that's gonna... that's uh, Hollywood's never changed. Like no. <laughs> Wow. Like if he came to town today and people believed this, like fucking every famous guy in town would be, Who, you know, Yeah. Would, would be Who else Fa- Fatty Arbuckle was that a I feel like that was a guy from that era. I should know this. I, I, like have, fat, I have several yeah, fatty film Fatty Arbuckle degrees. was a guy. Oh, in that wow. era. This is before he crushed that woman to death accidentally. <laughs> well, that's probably not what happened. But uh, that's what he got that's what he got tarred for. Right. It seems like he kinda got screwed over on that one. Uh and may have actually been a nice guy. I don't know if I don't Arbuckle. know either. We'll yeah. we'll do some research about it. <laughs> yeah, I did that we talk about it in the episode about the Nazis in Hollywood. Um mm. speaking of which, Nazis do come into this story later. Uh oh. Yeah, it's 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 gonna be fun. Now, after performing $40,000 worth of operations, John Brinkley hit upon the idea of expanding his practice. He decided to open a new clinic in Ensenada, California. I secured a location at Ensenada because of what appear to be climactic conditions peculiarly favorable to goat gland operations. To perform the operation most successfully, the surgeon should be located where the climate ranges around 70 degrees and is not subject to sharp changes. So... Mm-hmm. You really want those cool Southern California breezes on your goat balls. Yes, you do. Which, of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> That's just basic science. Yeah, absolutely. But alas, John Brinkley's ability to practice in the Golden State relied on his ability to get a permanent medical license there. And this was something that the state of California was unwilling to grant him, due in large part to the crusading work of Dr. Morris Fishbeam. Brinkley found himself denied and forced back to Milford. John put a good face on it, claiming he'd never really wanted to move out to California anyway, and that everyone knew the calm, restorative powers of the Kansas countryside were better for a hospital than stupid old California. Yeah. The re- yeah. <laughs> the reality is that he was deeply worried. Morris Fishbean and the AMA were increasingly riding his ass for all of the, uh, you know, the dangerously unregulated surgery that he was performing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brinkley fired back by having his publicity people shoot out even more testimonials from satisfied goat testicle recipients. His <laughs> testimonials. Sen- Sorry. Testimonials. Oh, I didn't even get that. That's good. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. Testimonials. Yeah. <laughs> we'll make that. It. Okay, Sophie, can we t-shirt that? <laughs> she's nodding, not reluctantly. She's re- nodding enthusiastically. Mm-hmm. So anyway. Maybe, maybe goat ball recipient t-shirts that just say... I have a goat's testicles in me. We'll we'll work on the copy. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll keep we'll keep we'll keep banging that back and forth. <laughs> 
Brinkley's biggest coup uh, was Senator Wesley Staley of Colorado, who called Brinkley and his wife, quote, two of the finest people and the greatest benefactors to mankind on earth. I wear goat glands and am proud of it. That's what we put on the shirt. <laughs> and then below that, testimonial. Testimonial. Hmm. Dr. Brinkley collected 100 different testimonials, testimonials in a, into a book called Shadows and Sunshine and published it in an effort to fight back against what he claimed was the AMA's dangerous misinformation. The AMA tried to repost, most notably with a series of posters titled Testimonials Are Worthless, which featured testimonials from patients claiming to have been cured of various diseases from quack medicine on mo- one side, and then those patients' death certificates listing the cause of death as the exact illness they'd claimed to have had cured on the other side. Mm. These facts had close to zero impact on the American people. Not Folks truly. still clambered to spend 65... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> people still were more than willing to spend $750 each on goat glands. Mm-hmm. But what about the folks who were too poor for Dr. Brinkley's revolutionary testicle surgery? Well, according to the book Charlatan, quote, Brinkley had this angle covered already with his special gland emulsion, which he sold mail order for $100, rectal syringe included. Oh. Wait, hang on. If you couldn't afford to get goat balls implanted in your body, he would send you a bunch of ground up goat testicles and an ass syringe. Okay. Let me be clear about this. Sure. If sure. you absolutely, I the I feel like you don't need a syringe to insert something into your rectum. Your rectum is already like has an opening that you can put stuff in there. Why? Yeah, do you... but you really want you want to squirt this stuff up there. You really okay. want to. I mean, I don't I don't know if you've ever squirted <laughs> squirted ground up goat testicles inside your asshole, but you you really want to get you want to get them like, uh, right up in them guts. Okay, right up in them guts. <laughs> that's because that's where testicles do their most important work is right up in them guts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I yeah, knew exactly, that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Of course. This Question. is just basic science. <laughs> we, we all we all we all graduated eighth grade. We know how science works. Yes. You shut you, you shove the goat balls as far up your ass as you can go, and then you're healthy again. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. I just I'm like I want to puke at the thought of a rectal syringe. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of the worst combination of words that that I can imagine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm ready. Of course, to go on. people imitated uh, Dr. Brinkley's goat gland uh, uh, products. Uh, there was the Youth Gland Chemical Laboratory of Illinois, the Vitalo Gland Company of Denver, Glandol, Glantone, Glandine. Americans in the 1920s absolutely could not get enough glands. The money flowed in, and John Brinkley eventually realized that he needed to do something with it. He decided to build a radio transmitter. Uh, wait, in 19... oh, I wasn't expecting yeah, that. Yeah, you didn't call that, did you? <laughs> no. nobody, nobody calls that shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he decides to build a radio transmitter. In 1923, he got his first broadcasting license and started construction of a massive uh, transmitting tower, one of the very first in the American Midwest. Now, radio wasn't really something that existed in a big way back then. It Mm -hmm. was early enough in the history of the medium that there was actually quite a bit of debate as to whether or not advertising should even be allowed on the radio. Uh, Most of what was out there was just broadcasts of symphony orchestras and other really boring bullshit. Mm -hmm. Brinkley Station, KFKB, which stood for Kansas First, Kansas Best, was going to be different. While he waited for construction to be completed, John Brinkley and many left the critical business of implanting goat balls into people to their assistance and went on an ocean liner voyage to Asia. They stopped in China, where Dr. Brinkley inserted goat testicles into the president of the Bank of Peking. Then they steamed hard to Japan, where Brinkley proceeded to insert more goat glands into more human males. On April 21st, 1923, the Gettysburg Star and Sentinel ran this article. Gland transplantation now used by Japan to put aged and firm back at work. High class goat prices soar. Okay. Okay. Quote from that article. Goat gland transplantation has been made compulsory in Japan by the government in order to rejuvenate aged charity patients. Within the past few months, more than 2,000 of these inmates have been undergone the operation and are all again earning their own living. So that's exciting. Yeah. It was a it was a lie obviously. But. I mean, y- yes, it was, but also if you if you look at it from the point of view that it's not a lie, he's actually like a really good person. <laughs> yeah, if you if you pretend it's not a lie, he's an incredible doctor. I'm surprised that he when you were saying earlier that he like sank so much of his money into uh like helping his town and I mean buying a bear that he did later shoot and kill, but I mean he is, I suppose he's he's more 
um, philanthropic than I would have imagined. But yeah, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Some of that may have been self preservation because it oh, pays that... off for him in a big way in the second part of this story. I see. Um, yeah, but I think also he just kind of wanted to be the biggest man in town. And if you're going to be the biggest man in town and you don't want people to hate you, you got to bribe them with nice things. Right. Right. Okay. So, Dr. Brinkley, through his interlocutors in the media, began to claim that the goat glands he was putting in people did more than just restore their vitality. They helped breed a better class of human being. It was thinking that was deliriously in line with the popular eugenics talking points of the day. As Uh one of his minions, Dr. W.H. Ballou of New York City told reporters, The children of parents who have been endowed with goat glands are healthy and alert to an unusual degree. New glands mean not only new vitality to men and women now living, but they actually mean better babies. I say in this, in making possible a superior type of human being, Dr. Brinkley has made a discovery of the first importance to mankind. So, uh, wait, is this the part of the story that the Nazis come in? Because I... No, shockingly enough, this is not the part of the story <laughs> okay. where the Nazis come into it. All yeah. right. Now, Dr. Brinkley was, in reality, about to make a discovery that would change the course of mankind and all of our lives forever. But that discovery had nothing to do with goat glands. It is, however, going to come next in part two of the epic tale of John Brinkley, the man who loved adding the balls of other animals to the balls of human beings. What a good cliffhanger. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, was, I was proud of that one, too. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin, you want to plug some pluggables? Sure. And don't 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 plug goat glands into the audience because there's <laughs> been enough of that done already. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess I have to undo some damage I did <laughs> to my patients. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Caitlin Durante. That's C-A-I-T-L-I-N. And then uh, you can listen to The Bechtel Cast, uh, my podcast about the re- representation of women in movies that super producer Sophie, sitting right next to me, also produces. Um and, you know, there hasn't been a biopic made about John Brinkley, but if there w- it was, you can bet your ass we would have covered it on the Bechtel cast. And so. you know what? I, I, I think it would pass the Bechtel test because uh, John Brinkley was a feminist icon. Yes. And actually, little known fact, um, placing the testicles of goats in to a human man, the act of that surprisingly enough, does pass the Bechdel test. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a little discussed corollary to the Bechdel test. Yes. Uh, but it, that you can either have two women have a conversation that, that doesn't involve a, a man or a relationship, or you can have somebody insert goat testicles into a human scrotum. Right, and I'm glad that yeah. we've cleared that up right now. Mm-hmm. Right it's here, an, right now. It's important. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, ch- check out my podcast, and, yeah, follow me on those places. <laughs> okay. You can find me on Twitter at I write okay. You can find me on the gram, as the kids call it, at, at Bastards Pod. And also, you can find this podcast on the gram at, at Bastards Pod. You can't find me there because Sophie runs both of those because I am not allowed. Um, but that's for, for the best. For the best. I'm sure she's nodding. Is she nodding, Caitlin? Yes. Enthusiastically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that seems right. Um, you can find t shirts on tpublic.com. I have another podcast called It Could Happen Here. Uh, if you feel like after this lively story of testicle implants, you want to hear uh, horrifying predictions of a civil war in modern America, you're a weirdo, but but that podcast exists. Maybe check it out. Yeah. Um, that's that's all I got. Uh, I love testicles. 